and it kind of yeah it reveals these priorities even to ourselves and even personally but they also have this other effect which is that they they have this effect of stripping the wallpaper off society if you sort of mean and they reveal the hidden structures underneath and of course what the covid crisis has has revealed has been a whole stack of things it it's exposed um uh, you know, a government machine that's been so weakened by decades of outsourcing um, and cuts that it actually no longer even has the capacity to act effectively in the strategic interest, even when it needs to. It exposed like these utterly broken procurement systems. You know, I was really struck by, you know, the story of Operation Dynamo in Dunkirk is such a huge part of our national sort of mythology. And yet actually, uh, government today literally doesn't know how to do that as you know doesn't didn't find itself unable to to procure ppe from a thousand small businesses um it exposed deep fragility in our social infrastructure you know an overstretched ahs it exposed the fact that millions of us are living in cramped depressing homes and, and neighborhoods that really aren't fit for spending any uh period of time in much less sort of weeks and months of lockdown um it exposed a deep structural racial injustice, you know, if the, it, through the fact that if you're, if you're from uh, an ethnic minority, if you're black, uh, especially, you're twice as likely to, to, in fact, four times as likely to die from COVID, I think, in that so far. And, you know, and that's all tied back to the fact that, you know, if you're, if you're black and from a, an ethnic minority, you are much more likely to be working in, in the service sector, much more likely to be living in an overcrowded home much more likely to have underlying health conditions which should do with our environment. Um, it exposed uh, epidemic uh, of loneliness and depression. I think domestic abuse skyrocketed by around 49% during the early part of the lockdown. Um, and it exposed deep weak stru you know, structural weaknesses in, in our economy, right? So even before the, the COVID had hit, we had flatlining productivity, we had failing high streets, we had struggling SMEs this economy which is sort of madly centralized around London and divided north-south, outsourced manufacturing, outdated construction industries, you name it, right? None of this is news to any of us. But there was one thing in particular that COVID exposed that I thought was really, really exciting or, or and compelling, which was to do with the cost of housing. Now we already know that we have this housing crisis, right? The cost of housing is inflated by something around 5,000% since, since the early 1970s. So vastly it's outstripped wages, putting us in this situation now where um, fewer than half of, of households own their own home in the UK today. And there's a whole generation who will never ever have, a, it, it would seem, have a chance to own their own home and all the associated problems that come with that. And this really interesting thing is if you think back to the first few weeks of the lockdown and we had uh, the chancellor saying that he would do whatever it takes right that 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 bit essentially the game of of the covid lockdown was essentially like pressing a massive pause button on the economy right and so whether you're a household or a business the essential game was the same which is that your income and incomings were probably going to be freezing so we also needed to freeze the outgoings to essentially pause the whole thing and for most households, the single biggest outgoing is your mortgage or your rent, right? It's the cost of, of living. So pausing mortgages is not difficult. Pausing mortgages is relatively easy. You give people a mortgage payment holiday. It, it's sort of no one really loses out. You just add it on to the end of the mortgage. But there was one form of housing costs that government couldn't pause, which was rent. Right? The whole economy was going into lockdown, and yet the rent was still due. And so we found ourselves in this really, really weird situation where taxpayers were pouring billions and billions of pounds of life support into the economy, but a huge chunk of it was going straight through to landlords. And so it, you know, I would say it's, it's a bit like, if you think of the economy like a bucket, it's, uh, it's a bit like having a massive hole in the bottom of the bucket or rather in the top of the bucket. Um, so inevitably what happened is that millions and millions of young people started asking the question that was under our noses all along, which is, well, wait a minute, what exactly is it that we pay landlords to do? And the answer is nothing, right? We're paying them not to evict us, if you like. And that's an extraordinary realization that, you know, we're in a country that we believe very strongly in values like fairness and hard work and enterprise and innovation and meritocracy and community and individual freedoms 
And yet the single biggest outgoing in most people's lives is a kind of fee paid by poor people to rich people for nothing, for just having money in the first place. And that that fee has been going up and up and up and up. So, you know, there's something really huge going on there. Now, usually when we talk about that, that, that problem, the, the language we use is the housing crisis. But the truth of it is that it's not actually a housing crisis, it's actually a land crisis, right? If you, if you, if you have a house that's worth, say, £400,000, you know, I've got news for you, which is most of that value is not the house, it's the land. And when its value goes up, it's the land that goes up. Uh, you know, it, 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 if you want to uh, uh, test this theory, um, like try taking your house down and putting it on the back of a lorry and seeing how much you get for it on eBay, right? <laughs> you won't get much. It's, it's a heap of old bricks. Um, and it's not even a land crisis, right? It's a land system. It's the rules of the game hard coded into the legal firmware of our society and our economy. Now, all the, the systemic crises and weaknesses that I talked about, they're, they're hugely complex, right? And they're hugely intertwined. But what's fascinating is that they all have their roots in the land system. Basically, I believe that, read, and the more I've looked at this, I've come to realize that redesigning that land system is the single most important reform project of this century. That's, and, uh, that's what I, I believe, and hopefully in about half an hour's time, that's what you're gonna believe. Um, so we have to, uh, like many times when we wanna go forwards, we have to start by, by going backwards. Where, does our, where did our land system come from, right? Uh, and uh, the, essentially, um, at, at risk of being sort of um, shot by historians for oversimplification, um, our land system has its origins in a problem that was unique to medieval kings, right? Which is how do you fund military campaigns and defense uh, at, without having a standing army? Because standing armies have a habit of being expensive and turning on you. And it was the Frankish kings, in particular William the Conqueror, who perfected the answer. And the answer was a piece of paper. And the piece of paper was a contract between the king and the law and, and, and his lords, his nobles, that would say, you give me soldiers to participate in, you know, wars and so forth and defense. And in exchange, I will give you your own private personal fiefdom where you can levy taxes as high as people can bear to pay. That's the quid pro quo. So rent is actually the original tax, the original form of tax paid via lords to the king. In fact, the word feudal comes from the Latin feudalis, meaning fee. So literally the whole system of government by which the Normans ruled over the Anglo-Saxons was based on rent. But um, if you're a king, essentially uh, there's only three types of people that you're scared of, which is other kings, uh, your, your own family, and your nobles, right, the lords. So gradually over time, uh, the lords managed to engineer a set of concessions from kings, um, whereby in taxes ultimately for running the state began to be levied directly on people and businesses, which left the lords essentially as the monopoly owners of a, a, a kind of the right to extract this kind of privatized tax. So it is taxation without any service, basically. So what you end up with is essentially a, a set of legally bounded power relations in society, which is, is effectively a kind of diluted sort of a younger sibling of slavery, slavery if you like. And, and actually the, the economist Henry George um, uh, articulated this really, really well in his book, um, uh, Progress and uh, Poverty. Uh, he said, ownership of land always gives ownership of people. Place 100 people on an island from which there's no escape. Make one of them the absolute owner of the others or the absolute owner of the soil. It will make no difference either to the owner or the others. Either way, one individual will be the absolute master of the other 99. So if you fast forward to um, uh, 
and this is this is actually true by the way if you look back through the political history of the uk the reform act it's essentially a political history of land um it, it, but it literally that that case if you fast forward to um the end of the civil war uh, in the usa um you, you had this really fascinating situation where the, the the plantation owners were like right we've got to free the slaves so say so, right you're free now and we're going to and they managed to kind of reduce the definition of slavery, if you like, to whether workers were effectively owned and, and, and paid, right? So they said, right, we're, we're free now, but you still need to eat. So here's a job, we're gonna pay you $2 a day. Uh, and by the way, here's the housing on the plantation and guess what, the rent is $2 a day. Um, which by the way, is this whole interesting architectural history of these things called chattel houses, which arose as a result, which are kind of early form of kit house that, um, a plantation workers could use to try and if, if, if escape exploitative landlords by moving off their land. But of course, the difference, you know, the, the difference of this sort of this this indenture, if you like, is it, it is you, you can move off that land, but you, you then you've got to move on to someone else's land. So you're not owned by a single owner, if you like, but you still have this sort of um, this due pay this this fee that you're due. So really the only way to live free from rent is to just leave society and basically go and live in a cave, right? Um, again, fast forward through that to today and we haven't come as far as we'd like to think we have, right? In the sense that today land is still the fundamental mechanism of inequality and especially it's the fundamental mechanism of, of, of racial inequality. And I don't know, a lot of you may have seen that really amazing video of an American writer called Kimberly Jones. And she gave this amazing speech. Um, this is during the Black Lives Matter protests. And um, the, she gave this amazing speech about uh, trying to explain to white people what racial injustice felt like. And she said, imagine playing 400 rounds of Monopoly with the game stacked against you. Now, what's fascinating is that actually there's an interesting backstory behind that, which some of you may know, which is that the game of Monopoly was actually originally invented um, as, a, uh, as a kind of a, a form of activism. It was originally called the, the Landlord's Game. It was invented by a, a lady called Elizabeth Magee. Um, to kind of capture and ca to, to sort of capture and communicate the ideas of Henry George. And the idea of the landlord's game was that everybody would realize uh, that if we allow this system of land monopoly, eventually one person just eats up everyone else on the board. Of course, it dramatically backfired <laughs> as a game because everyone thought, oh, this is great. I get to kind of eat up everyone else on the board. It might be me that wins. So, but yeah, there's an interesting backstory um, there effectively the game Monopoly failed to get its message across for exactly the same reason that this system of land monopoly has persisted for so long, which is that so many people think, well, hopefully I'll be on the winning team somehow, magically, eventually. So broadly speaking, what we have is this, this power diagram, right? And, and, and broadly speaking, there are two positions in this diagram, which is tenant and landlord, right? Over time, roughly two things happened. So one is that that piece of paper became a tradable asset. So you can buy the right to extract taxes from people. And I, I, it baffles me that we don't find this weirder than we do. Like it's written, it, it's hidden in plain sight right there in the language we use, land lord. You can buy the right to be lord over someone, which is very odd. But of course, the other thing is that this sort of overclass underclass diagram is politically quite difficult to sustain, right? Because you need to keep people's pitchforks in the cupboard. So over time, what we saw is an emerging array of tenures, and particularly we created a third sort of position in the diagram where effectively you can raise enough money to buy your own freedom from rent. And again, the clue is in the language that we use, free hold. It's not free as in no cost, it's free as in liberty, right? Um, so yeah, this leads us to the reason why house prices are so high, right? Um, which is, of course, is an area beset by misunderstandings and myths. Essentially, the price that you pay for a piece of land, right, that um, is not the, the, the cost, what it costs to produce. It didn't cost anything to produce. It was just there, right? It's a piece of paper. Um, the price is set by how much someone somewhere is willing to pay for it. 
this is basically what Adam Smith and David Ricardo's work was all about. It's called the law. Um, and, and so you say, uh, effectively the, um, but at least that's, that's a kind of linear relationship, right? In the sense that when people's wealth goes up, so let's say an area like gets wealthier because of, because of enterprise or, or, or industry, or people arrive with more money, um, the rents go up, right? But at least that's a relatively linear relationship in the sense, you know, like travelers on a road get wealthier, you would expect the highwaymen to get help, to get wealthier, right? Um, that doesn't explain the sort of mad exponential escalations of prices that, we, that we've seen in our lifetimes. Essentially, the short version of that story is that because this, um, this, this power relationship creates a sort of hunger for economic freedom, right? People want to buy their freedom from rent. It creates an infinite market for debt. So during the 1970s and onwards, what happened is that we massively deregulated uh, private mortgage lenders so they could bet so, uh, and, and brought down the interest rates so that we could um, lend. They could essentially create more debt. And of course, people could borrow more. That meant they could pay more. And if they could pay more, they could. Uh, so house prices went up and then looked at those inflated house prices and said, oh, great, we've got more security against our loan. We'll lend even more. If you've seen the big short, the film, The Big Short, you're familiar with this story, right? Um, until 2008, when it sort of crashed, except it didn't really crash. Because what happened in the UK is essentially the government stepped in and said, no, we're going to underwrite the, va the value of, of land effectively in, in, in the UK, which was effectively equivalent to putting up a massive advert over the country that says, hey, rich people of the world, you know, don't bother investing in actual stuff or businesses. Um, come and put your money in UK land and we, you can even extract tax from our citizens. Um, and so what we've seen since 2008 is another surge, partly driven by things like the help to buy, but also by this surge in landlordism. And I think COVID unfortunately is driving exactly the same um, path. All of that leads us to the point we're at today where at the beginning of this year, at least, um, the total value of all, the, all of UK property rights, that is all those pieces of paper, um, those land taxation rights, is £8.6 trillion. That's 83% of the total wealth of the UK. But hold that in your mind for a moment, right? All the businesses, all the gold, all the everything is a tiny slice of the wealth. Most of our money is in these, these pieces of paper. By the way, the, the equivalent figure globally is around $280 trillion. And again, to put that in perspective, all the gold in the world is only worth about $7 trillion. And all the, the, the personal data owned by all the Silicon Valley companies is only worth about $3 trillion. So this is the biggest game in town by a very, 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 very long way. Now we talk about this as a form of wealth. We say, oh, my house went up in value, but it's not wealth, right? You can't get at that wealth. It's not wealth, it's a tax. It's a private sector tax, and it's a tax on almost every form of social and economic activity. Last year in uh, the, the UK, uh, by, the, by which I mean 2019, we spent 71 billion pounds on rent and 67 billion pounds on mortgage payments. That's enough to run at least a whole other NHS, right? And of course the cost doesn't just fall on us, it also falls, or rather it just doesn't fall us on individually, it falls on us collectively. So again, last year we paid, the, the, the total housing benefit bill in the UK was 23 billion pounds. Uh, that's more than we spend on highways, police and military equipment put together, just to rent back our own land effectively from landlords. Uh, a lot of whom were private, private sector landlords, by the way. So all goes back to land and, and, and in simple terms, basically, the more we have to spend on the cost of land, the, the less we have to spend on everything else in life, in time and money. So, um, yeah, it's not wealth, right? It's a, it's a tax. And the truth is this land system is not making us wealthy. It looks like it is, but in practice, it's actually in, literally impoverishing us. It's a manufactured form of poverty. So we need to kind of talk about well where does that value come from right because if if it's so expensive surely it's because it's scarce right so why don't we just release more land not quite right unfortunately 
that doesn't work. <laughs> uh, not, not so simply, because the value of land is not in mud, right? The mud in Westminster is not any more valuable than the mud in Warwickshire, but it's worth millions and millions of pounds more, right? What you're paying for when you buy a piece of land is not the, the, the plot, it's the mud itself, right? It's the access to that location. Land value is location value. So it's infrastructure, infrastructure connection, proximity to jobs, to schools, to culture, to green space, to trees, to a beautiful postcode or a trendy postcode, you know, full of attractive people, whatever. You know, if I said to you, I'm going to give you a plot, you know, I've got a plot of land in Siberia. Um, it's got no infrastructure and no police and it's roamed by bandits and it takes you several days to get to it. How much will you give to me for it? You'll, you'll go, you'll laugh at me, right? But if I say, oh, I've got the same size plot of land in Kensington, you'd look at me like you just won the lottery. So one of the best speeches ever made about this was made in 1909. And the title of the speech was The Mother of All Monopolies. And it included these lines. Roads are made, streets are made, services are improved, electric light turns night into day, water is brought from reservoirs a hundred miles off the mountains, and all the while the landlord sits still. To not one of these improvements does the land monopolist contribute, and yet by every one of them the value of his land is enhanced. He renders no service to the community, contributes nothing to the general welfare, and nothing to the process from which his own enrichment is derived. Now you think, oh, what kind of mad lefty made this speech? Uh, it was Winston Churchill, right? and I and I and I put I, I I sort of put that in. I point that out um, in, as a, a way to highlight this is not a left versus right issue. This is way deeper than that, and it precedes all of that. Um, so the the fundamental principle at the heart of all this, which is the, which is also what Adam Smith set out, is a really really simple one, which is essentially this, which is that land value, all land value is not created by the owner. It's created by the community. It's created by the taxpayer through our investment into roads and schools and infrastructure. And it's created by the activity and the presence of the community and indeed through the planning system through our collective consent for development. But we, in this current system, we allow this, that publicly created value to be privately captured and monopolized. And of course, it's, it's not just monopolized by landlords. It's also monopolized by all of us, right? It's monopolized by freeholders. So, you know, it's known that an Ofsted excellent rated school adds nearby, adds around 40 to 100K to the value of a property sometimes, right? And yet we tell ourselves that we have no school fees, but it's not true. We pay the school fees in the house prices, in the land prices. And then we wonder why children from back, you know, deprived backgrounds struggle to get an equal shot. You know, we, we use this phrase, the postcode lottery, it's not a lottery, it's a stitch up. Um, now, and this is where we come to the final sort of twist, as, twist of the knife, if you like, uh, which is a pretty fatal one, which is because we allow these uplifts in land value, right, when the value of, of a location goes up, whether it be because the area has improved, because there's new infrastructure, or just because people can, can borrow more and pay more, um, we allow, because we allow that to be captured by the landowner, what we have effectively done is created a multi-million dollar market for land speculation. So we created a whole series of companies whose business model is essentially equivalent to ticket touts at a concert. Essentially, the business model is you buy land before it has planning permission, you get planning permission on it, at which point its value shoots up by millions and millions of pounds overnight. Then you, you, you build the cheapest, crappiest, tiniest, ugliest, least sustainable homes you can basically get away with, uh, provide the least possible number of social rented homes and the least possible amount of community infrastructure, all probably swimming in a kind of sea of tarmac. Um, and then you sell them to the mortgage market for as much as possible. And this, if, you, if like me, you, 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 you've worked in, in architecture or the built environment, Professions, sort of professions, this is the sort of open dark secret at the heart of, of the built environment today that almost everybody agrees with what we want from our, from our towns and our cities, right? We want beautiful architecture, we want generous homes, affordable zero carbon homes, we want resilient communities, we want green walkable streets, we want prosperous neighborhoods with small businesses, right? All of that, it, 
essentially our land system is perfectly designed to never ever give it to us. In fact, to do the exact opposite if possible. Now, I wanna be really clear, this is not because landlords and speculative land developers are not perfectly decent people. They're not especially greedy or anything like that. I used to be a landlord as well. This is not about blaming the players, it's about the game, right? It's about rehabilitating ourselves, fixing a broken game that we are all locked into because it's taking us collectively over a cliff. The most extraordinary thing I think about the land system is um, that weirdly, no one agrees with it, right? <laughs> like you will not find a reasonable economic or moral justification of it anywhere on either the left or the right of the political spectrum. You just won't find one. It's essentially just a leftover, right? It's an accident of history. It's a leftover of the feudal system, but we're all kind of locked into it. You know, so much of us have so much, um, so much, if you like, to lose. But, you know, it's time for us to wake up and fix it. So, if we were to kind of completely go back to the drawing board today and design a new land system from scratch, which is based on our roughly agreed values as a society, what would it look like? The good news is that pretty much every major economist and philosopher who's looked seriously at this question, from Karl Marx to Milton Friedman, from Martin Luther King to Mariana Mazzucato, from Adam Smith to Abraham Lincoln, um, from ancient Israelites to Eleanor Ostrom, right? They've always come back with essentially the same fundamental principle, which is that land is a natural commons. It belongs to everyone. And that land value, that is rents, are collectively created. They're created by all of us. Therefore, it's naturally just that they should be recaptured by the community who, who created them in the first place. So the most, you know, so what would we do? The most obvious direct way, and this is, this is what um, uh, uh, sort of proponents of Henry George's ideas uh, uh, strongly advocate, um, would be uh, to introduce uh, what's called a land value tax, right? Or I, I mean, I don't really like the term land value tax. Um, I would call it a community ground rent, right? Um, so the idea being that as an owner of property, you're not a lord over anyone. You're a steward, basically. You're a custodian who is renting land from everyone for as long as you want it and for as long as you're using it. Um, uh, the, so so that, that, that's obviously a huge thing. Now, the cool thing about that idea is that it's one of very few radical ideas that ends up with generating money, right? So you then have this really interesting question of, okay, not only are we doing all the cool things like stopping speculation, et cetera, but it's generating a vast amount of, of revenue. What should we do with it? Now, what you then do with, with the revenues of that community ground rent is gonna depend to some extent on your political preferences. And, I, and I, I like all of these options, right? So one option is obviously you can cut taxes, right? Essentially the rent, rent and your mortgage bills are a tax that you're paying anyway. So the moment that tax goes to the treasury instead of to private landlords, essentially we, we, we renationalize that tax. The good news is that government can now afford to cut all the other taxes, right? So certainly council tax should just be gone. Council tax should not exist. Um, but there's you know, a whole bunch of other taxes that you might wanna get, get rid of as well. That's a cool thing that you could do. Um, essentially, the, the, the central idea being that we should, should tax unearned wealth, i.e. land rents, as much as possible, and we should tax labor and activity as little as possible. Another thing that you might want to do with that money is pay it back out into um, a, what's called a universal basic income or, or in, in, in my view, better called a citizen's dividend. So that every citizen gets a little bit of money um, based on rents. Right now, I think even if, that, even if that's only a relatively small symbolic amount, I think that would be a pretty cool thing to do because essentially it's a reminder that it would be act as a reminder that we all have a stake in society. You know, when our communi community gets wealthier, so do we. That simply by virtue of existing and being a citizen, 
you have a right to the Commonwealth. Um, and, and, and I think that would be a cool, a cool thing to do, at least with, with part of that, that money. But the other probably most obvious thing that we, we can do is use that money to reinvest back into the economy and society. So investing it into community infrastructure, taking some of the, uh, the, the especially that would include taking some of the land revenues from overheated areas like London, where I am now, um, and investing it in schools, green infrastructure, and basically creating more, better location value distributed across the whole country. So once and for all, we can just end this ridiculous corrosive north-south divide which which persists as a result of our current land system now um you could say right well <laughs> um that's great in principle but uh it's pol politically unlikely and i have to admit the first time I, I i i was talking about this um you know earlier on in the year that was sort of my assumption. And yet weirdly, as I've watched what's played out over the last few months, I wonder whether that's true, right? We are arriving at the moment, taxpayers are pumping huge amounts of money to prop up land values um, and indeed to inflate them, right? So we've seen stamp duty cuts and help to buy and all sorts, um, which is kind of mad because it's gonna crash, right? Probably um, again, because it always does, probably around 2025, 2026-ish, something maybe, maybe sooner. Um, and, and, and at the same time, we're running up this insane deficit. So maybe what seemed politically impossible, the thing about land value tax is it's sort of a running joke that everybody across the political spectrum, it's a sort of joke that everybody agrees with it in private, but everyone in public says it can't be done. And actually, uh, since we, as we are so often being told, we live in unprecedented times, it might well be that the scale of deficits we now face um, and indeed that Brexit, whether you're for it or against it, um, might be exactly the moment when we actually decide to do that. We need to fundamentally redesign our, our tax system um, to, to, to do this. Uh, but okay, let's say that is politically too ambitious. Maybe it does, it, it, that can't happen. What are the other options? Well, another sort of option or another sort of design strategy that we could take um, and by the way, none of these options, you know, I'm really, really focused on options where nobody should uh, be impoverished by these moves, right? So people might not be able to make money going into the future in the way that they have in the past, but they shouldn't be actively set back, if you see what I mean. And I think it's absolutely possible to wean ourselves off in that way. Again, this is not about blaming or punishing the players. It's about rehabilitating ourselves, moving to a new game. So. Another option which is actually worth considering is the idea of buybacks, public land buybacks. So uh, a Green Party campaigner called Martin Farley did some really interesting number crunching about this and worked out that actually as a taxpayer, we could buy up every private rented property in the UK tomorrow um, and actually we'd save money, we'd be, right? which is mental. Um, but makes sense when you think about it, right? Because if it's, if it's worth a, a private investor buying it to extract those, those, those rents, why wouldn't it be worth us collectively doing that? There's a lot of impractical, impracticalities around that, but again, uh, Josh Ryan Collins put in a really interesting proposal about saving high streets, um, which, which had similar elements of this, which is the idea that the, the Bank of England could effectively create, since the, since the pound is effectively underpinned by UK land values, effectively the Bank of England could create huge amounts of money, use that money to buy back the UK's land, and then effectively, by definition, we once again collectively become the landlord. And um, it's worth pointing as well to the work of um, Beth Stratford. Um, so um, uh, uh, she's an awesome economist, and she's been actively exploring the idea of essentially a similar sort of approach um, through um, essentially doing it through a kind of national community land trust. So there's lots and lots of interesting options in, in, in that space. And the third option, which overlaps a bit with that, and this is one that we've been looking at or, or, or beginning to, which is the idea of going back to the original piece of paper, right? Because this, these forms of capital are invented legal patterns, right? It's, it's legal words on a piece of paper. We can go back and redesign that piece of paper. So actually we're looking at this thing we currently call fairhold, which is effectively inventing a new form of home ownership called fairhold, not freehold, not leasehold, but fairhold. And effectively, the, what, what we're talking about doing there, looking at there with fairhold is the idea of separating out the unbundling ownership rights. 
So unbundling the good bits of ownership, such as having security of tenure and the freedom to build and improve your property, from arguably the bad bits of ownership, which is the right to use that to extract um, rent from other people or, or to earn a huge amount of money if its value goes up. So essentially the idea of, instead of what we're doing is sort of doing at the moment, which is eroding the definition of affordable housing beyond exhaustion and coming up with these hideous sort of shared, um, you know, shared ownership schemes, effectively that we should invent a new form of ownership that would allow a whole new generation to own their homes, but on different terms, on fair, fair terms. Um, so the same house that, that might cost 400K in the open market might cost say 200K under fairhold, um, I say under freehold, um, and it might not the open market, but, um, or it might only cost you say 100K, the build cost, but then you pay a reasonable monthly community ground rent instead. So, so that's um, kind of uh, interesting idea. Um, what's interesting about that idea as well, and, and obviously gets me, uh, I find fascinating, is it doesn't rely on Westminster legislating, right? It doesn't rely on getting power in Westminster. That's something that any local authority, for example, could start using tomorrow for, for no money, right? So, um, you know, and that's something that we're going to continue to work on and we'd love to work on with, with, with others as, as, a, as a collaborative um, project to, to explore that. But you know that's only one idea. I didn't want to come. I not want to come on here and sort of to push my ideas, but rather to talk about this bigger vision. And I expect many of you in this conversation have uh, better ones. Um, so I, 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 the key thing is that once we understand, well, once we start to see the system clearly, when we can see how it works, um, and we can start applying our collective ingenuity to it. But the one thing I think we must do to finish. One thing I think we really must do is we need to cha start changing our language around the way that we talk around this. We need to um, reject a lot of the language in that that's sort of designed to distract and obfuscate us from the real issue. So these kind of false framings that keep the land system hidden in plain sight. So I think we probably need to stop talking about the word housing crisis because actually it's lots of different housing crises and most of what we call the housing crisis is actually a symptom. Of our land, of, of our broken land system, I, and I think we also need to stop pretending that we can build out of this system. It's a really kind of really common common myth that if we build more homes, that it's just a problem of supply and demand, and if we build more homes, it will change our land system. It's not, and we can roll out dense, you know, sort of multi-page reports as to why it's not, um, but it's not, right? Um, so we need to stop pretending that we can we can build our way out of the of this this land system um, without reforming it. Um, I think we need to stop asking ourselves questions like how much money would it take to end homelessness or how much money would it take to end poverty? Like we can end homelessness. We can we can build as many affordable homes as we want tomorrow for, for net zero pounds, right? We can we can end poverty any time we like in the UK for zero pounds. The, the solution isn't money, it's to just stop manufacturing poverty that is built into our, into our land system. Um, but I think also what we need to be doing is we need to invite people to imagine with us what another land economy could look like. You know, imagine what would happen if we took this moment in history to take the wealth out of our land and put it back into economy into, into the economy and into society. You know, imagine a Britain in 10 years time where everyone who wants to can own a home. They can put down roots and, and have a stake in the place where they live, where we don't have to be arguing about children going hungry in the holidays, right? Where there's no such thing as a class size that's bigger than 10, where there, was no, there are no permanently homeless people or indeed uh, permanently peopleless homes, really, right? Not for long, where we can fund the NHS several times over if we want to, right? Imagine uh, Britain where no one earning less than 100K, say, earns, pays any income tax at all, and small local businesses pay zero tax except on things like carbon, alcohol, or sugar, or things like that, right? things that we want to, to disincentivize. That's the real purpose of tax. Um, you know, imagine a Britain in 10 years' time where in all the money that today we invest into land speculation, 
uh, uh, and landlordism. Instead, we invest in actual real productive businesses and innovation. So Britain becomes very, very rapidly a world leader in green innovation. And we start to sort of wean ourselves off these mad boom and bust cycles, which by the way, are all to do with land. Go and look up an economist called Fred Harrison. He explains it brilliantly, um, as well as Carlos Perez, by the way. Um, you know, imagine living in neighborhoods that weren't built to sell or build to rent, but just build to live, right? Imagine if every new home we built from tomorrow is beautiful, zero carbon, day lit, healthy, you know, with, with gardens or shared green spaces. So old people could live close to their grand, grandchildren, walkable, cyclable streets full of trees. At the end of the road, there's a kind of high street, which has got thriving, fri thriving small businesses, maybe like a, a library of things. Like what I'm talking about is not utopia. It's not wild. It's, it's actually a 21st century of, of Britain based on that works the way that most of us think it should already work anyway. Right. Like, and it's not based on some imaginary magic money, money tree. All the money that we need to end poverty, to stop climate collapse, to renew the social contract, to build a happier, you know, more prosperous economy is already here. Right. There is enough for everyone already here. It's about finally upgrading our economy from this obsolete firmware. Right. We've got to leave behind this, this finally, this, this feudal system, this feudal operating system that we've been running for the last 954 years. Now it's really hard to do this, right? Because the, the land, you know, land, if you talk about land, it's not sexy, it's not emotive, it's really complicated. It involves challenging some of the, the ways that we've been told to look at the world. But the good news is that once you see it, you cannot unsee it. And I hope some of you are already feeling like that if you weren't familiar with, with some of the things I've said today. The most important thing to remember about the land system is it is not inevitable. Our land system is not, it was designed. It is written on paper by, by humans. It was designed. And if it was designed in the 11th century, it can absolutely be redesigned in the 21st. And with that, I will close my mouth, so hopefully some of you can open your mouth. Thank you so much, Alistair. That was so inspiring, <laughs> like all the calls to action at the end. Um, shall we have some questions from the floor? Who wants to go first? I was actually going to mention um, my friend's from Hungary, and she said, I think it was in the 70s, the authorities there just gave over land and then issued um, sort of architectural packs to um, the people and um so her mum and dad built um their home just from this blueprint that they got from given by the government um and um esther was actually saying she was like oh, but all the the landowners are like what did they do with all their amazing furniture and things that they they were just it was just taken off them and then given to the people so um she was she was genuinely worried about the people who had their land taken off i was like but esther <laughs> they took it in the first place like it's not as if it was theirs before and um, it's been stolen before so yeah yeah although the good the good news is i think we can do we can we can transition to a new land economy without taking on furniture i'm pleased yeah. <laughs> um who wants to go Jeff. yes thanks a brilliant talk um I wish I could have said the same thing as well. Um, just an extra, um, isn't most of the value of the land in the country, the trillions you talked about, uh, can't you identify that as planning permission? Because if the planning permission were not there, you'd be just left with agricultural or other land. And uh, if, if you take the planning permit and, and 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 it's not the big rolling estates that uh is the land value which is the impression we get from newspaper articles it's the land under people's houses and the right to have a building on that land so can, can we not change the planning system to spread the wealth around uh, by spreading the planning permission around 
Y yeah, but um, so it's a, it's a really yeah really interesting question. Um, the uh, and of course it is it, it, we 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 experienced a transition right because throughout most of Britain's history. Uh, most of the wealth came from farming, right? So that actually this is where all this began with the acts of enclosure and and and, and, and things like that. Um, so rural land was the thing, whereas now today rural land has, has very, very low value. And as you say, what has much higher value is the moment you give planning permission for land, for, la to land, uh, for houses on land, immediately you've created a, a thing which where you essentially have the legal right to take up to 50% of someone's um, house up their wages um, and, and what they can borrow from the mortgage market. So that's why today land for housing is worth so much more. But you've got to remember the planning system doesn't, it only regulates land scarcity. It doesn't really create land scarcity, right? So if I take take that example of that site in Siberia, if I told you, by the way, it's got no infrastructure, no schools, um, it's got no police and there's bandits roaming on it, but by the way, it does have planning permission on it. You'd be like, uh, no thanks. So the reason the planning system was originally created was actually to regulate development and to create a feedback loop so that we can actually pay for infrastructure. That was the original idea it was because there was lots of disease and they needed to pay for, for sanitation and things like that. So actually, this land, although we've got loads of land, what we really need is land with infrastructure as well. So that's like, uh, you know, web connections, sanitation, schools, hospitals, and that has to be paid for. So, yes, we could do that. But actually, we need to make we need to close that land that 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 circle so that the land value uplift that's being created when we give planning permission on land is being used to pay for the new schools, roads, green energy infrastructure, etc. Which at the moment we're not closing that circle because so much of that money is just going off to private speculators. But, but all that infrastructure is much much cheaper than the around here two hundred thousand pounds worth of planning permission yeah it's crazy um, yeah but so you're, you're so quite right about yeah. the locational aspect of land values uh, uh, but it, it, in york you, you, on the outskirts we've got loads and loads of land compared to the housing need yet it's screwed down by planning permission and that's that scarcity which puts the values up from i don't know 30, 40,000 to three or 400. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, yeah. And I, and I think that's, that's, um, you know, that's the thing we, planning is a democratic mechanism, right? And we have to work out how to collectively give consent to do that. Now at the moment, because our land system is so broken, people are usually uh, are anti-development, not least because they think the development will be poor quality, which it sadly often is because it's done by speculators and or they think that um, uh, they just see all that wealth going off to, to into private hands instead of being reinvested in community infrastructure. So I think um, that's also part of squaring that circle is how do we win political consent to actually say, yeah, let's open up those, um, let's open up those bits of land and, and develop them really high quality. Um, yeah. A bit and more knowledge wouldn't help, wouldn't hurt. For everyone. More knowledge for everyone. <laughs> um, right. Uh, has anyone else got any questions? I'm just working through the chat here. But uh, I'll, can... I'll ask a question while she's yeah, reading. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> In your opinion, Alistair, is this something that could be piloted at a local authority or combined authority level, or is it something where there needs to be a like a national level overhaul or yeah. is this something that if we have uh, had a favorable leader in a particular constituency or area that we could start to evidence the benefits that you predict in a way that would then get more people to buy in if they're more skeptical yeah and this is for me this is one of the reasons why i'm a designer and not a politician um because i think we can design new mechanisms, new forms of ownership, for example, or new, for, new development models. So we're working on dark matter with dark matter labs on, on, um, uh, on, on, on a new development model that councils can use. Um, it's not new, by the way, it's, it's a way of stitching together lots of existing pieces. Um, but, um, and th that is exactly right. So yet yeah, sure, like, God, I mean, this thing is huge. And, and yes, this, this should be what is being, being the focus of, of, of change in Westminster as well. But let's not wait for that. Like, truthfully, if I were the leader of one of the opposition parties right now, I would be doing exactly what you just described, which is saying, you know, I'm not even going to wait to get in power. I'm going to take one of our, the local authority areas 
um, that we do have control. I'm, I'm going to do everything in our, in, our, in our legal possibility. So that includes borrowing, um, you know, or creating vehicles to do, low, you know, low interest rates borrowing to, be, to, do, to do things like building uh, social rented homes, but also um, taking new bits of land. So, you know, we've worked with a number of local authorities and identified the fact that almost all local authorities have many, many, many small plots of land. A lot of the, develop, the, the speculative developers haven't, won't touch them. Right, but they don't have the capacity to build them out themselves into affordable homes. So what if every council um, started um, issuing fairhold ownership things to people and saying, right, by the way, you can buy this or rent this plot of land at a fair rate um, if you can then build a zero carbon home on top of it and live in it, right? So uh, yes is the answer. And it doesn't, it's not a question of money, right? It, because, because land is at the center of all our money systems anyway. Mm. And just one tiny follow up question. Have you got any kind of warm contacts that look like they're favourable to do that? Or are you still looking for the it's, pioneer? It's all of us. What's really interesting is that everybody thinks that it's somebody else's um, uh, thing. And that should, they love, particularly in housing, we love the idea that somebody to blame. And actually, all that happens is we all end up standing in a circle bashing somebody else over the head. Um, the, 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 the short answer to your question is that privately, um, and more than privately, actually, also professionally, there are lots of people in local authorities who are who are really big on this and really behind this. But you should not underestimate how difficult it is, how much, how you know, working within organisations that are already under pressure and underfunded, right? Um, trying to innovate within the, the, those sorts of organisations that, that have a kind of old firmware. Everything in their organisational DNA is saying no, keep doing it that way. That's how we do it. So it's re it takes extraordinary strength, ingenuity and leadership um, to make that happen, but it will happen. And um, yeah, we are working with a number of local authorities to, to explore those sorts of pilots. So, and, and I'm sure other people here are as well. Yeah, I'd say we're looking at this idea with City of York Council for a project that we're working on, this is a community-led project um, called Op House, which everyone can have a look at as well. Yeah, and I think, and, and I, you know, also, you know, there in York, you've also got your space, right? And yeah. uh, they're okay. awesome. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. what we need to do is stop seeing those things as sort of alternative outliers and start seeing them as um, the, the kind of the prototypes of the, fu the future. Definitely. Um, Sarah, did you want to? It was basically just to follow up up what Anna said. I mean, down in Brighton, I think you need a mix of the people and political will. And down in Brighton, the council has really got on board with the idea of community-led housing. There's so many different projects going on. I put in the chat um, about Bunker, which is a self-build co-op. Now that's been facilitated because it was a very small site that Brighton didn't want to build on themselves. And they're just renting it out at peppercorn rates. So why can't all local authorities do this? Yeah. You know, they, they've said, I suppose it's a pilot yeah. scheme. Yeah, and by the way, it doesn't even have to be peppercorn rates. I mean, admittedly, no, there, are, there are a lot of areas, not in Brighton, I suspect, but there are a lot of areas in different bits of the country where, I mean, sadly, land values in a way, sadly, uh, land values are so low that effectively peppercorn rate is actually the market value. But um, th they should be developed, right? Because that's how we create, start creating place value, right? Is actually say, don't say, oh, it's unviable. What do you mean? It's not viable to make a place better. What kind of yeah. de definition? Of so yeah, exactly. Like it's, an, for, it's a no brainer. I think. Yeah, totally. and, it doesn't, and it doesn't have to be at peppercorn rates, right? We want local authorities to go, yeah, you know what? Actually, there's, there's, there's years worth of land revenues, of, la of land rent revenues that the one people the one set of people who we should be paying land rents to are ourselves, i.e. Our, yeah. our, our elected bodies. I think there's parameters there for local authorities to look at best value and they need to inject that with the social value element as well, instead of just looking for the highest price. I mean, the area that I live actually in Harrogate, completely different local authorities to somewhere like York, in, in the sense that all they want to do is make profit. Yeah. Yeah, but that, yeah, I mean, it's a long, long, complicated story, but even without getting down the thing of trying to account for social value, which is really, really hard, there's ways of making it step, step up. Yeah, like yeah, definitely. The best, value, the best value constraints are not nearly as constraining as a lot of people think they are. Yeah, thanks. I'm afraid we've only got one minute left because we have got another talk happening in 15 minutes and I need a toilet break and all that sort of stuff. Um, but Alice is joining <laughs> us for um, 
a conversation later about citizen action in cities. Um, the link there is in the chat. If anyone else wants to join on to that session, it should be really fascinating. And I'm sure we'll carry on some of these threads into that um, conversation this evening at seven. Um, thank you so, so much, Alistair, for your time today. It's been so inspiring and insightful. No, thank, thank you. And thank you everyone as well for all the uh, comments in the chat. I just want to see how I can sort of um, yeah, well, I think you can save later. it if you click on the dot dot dot. Um, yeah. But it will save if you if uh, you save chat. Mind. Brilliant. Yeah, That's save fantastic. the chat because there's I've so many questions there. Well. <laughs> Amazing. Um, yeah, cool. Amazing. Thank you so much, and um, thanks everyone for your input as well. Cheers. Cheers, everyone.